I want to see United Ireland, certainly mm. in my lifetime, and I hope that it's it's I hope that it's close. Um, but if Brexit has taught us anything, is that you do not have a referendum or a poll mm. on a major constitutional change without doing your work first. Yeah. Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. This week's guest is the Fianna Fáil Brexit spokesperson, Lisa Chambers. Um, when you get a politician in these days, it's hard to know what's going to have happened by the end of the conversation. Uh, but it's important to talk about Brexit because it is the thing that is shaping um, every conversation right now, but also is going to shape Ireland for, for many years to come. And it was fascinating talking to Lisa about it. Uh, her point, her party's points of difference with Fine Gael on it, uh, and also a broader conversation about how somebody um, at the age of 34 becomes a leading light in Fianna Fáil and what that means for uh, somebody who you know had a very different career path in mind until she became a member of Fianna Fáil just over 10 years ago. It was a really interesting interview. Uh, before we go to it, don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels. And if you like the show, please leave a review. Lisa, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Um, when do you think we'll ever stop talking about Brexit? Honestly, I think it'll be with us for the next couple of decades. Do you? Um, I mean, when you think about it, we're only in phase one. We're only talking about the UK mm. exiting. This was meant to be the easy part. Well, I don't know. We probably thought it was going to be the easy part. Um, this is just them leaving, them mm. exiting. So we still have to do, do the whole discussion on the mm. future trading arrangement. And, you know, take, for example, Canada. That took nine years to negotiate a future trading arrangement. And it's the Canada style deal that mm. the, the current PM wants. So um, yeah, I think we have a long way to go on Brexit yet. And... Is that something that you as a politician relish? Like it is the greatest issue of our of our time. It's probably the most important issue that's affected this country in, you know, for 50 years. But like, is it something you relish or do you think, God, I'd love to be, I'd love not to be talking about Brexit today? Um, I suppose like, I, I love politics and mm. I'm interested in politics. And as a political issue, it's interesting for so many reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, the... The detail of the negotiations, the strategies, the different personalities, there's so much going on. But then on the other side of that, I think when I think about Brexit, I'm I'm so disappointed and I'm sad that the UK are choosing this path. Mm. Um, it's the first time, you know, that we'll, we'll, we'll be going different ways, yeah. Ireland and the UK. And I don't think we really know the impact that this is going to have between the two islands and between the UK and the European Union. I think it's changed it has already changed our relationship with the UK mm. and it has already changed the UK's relationship with the EU. And I think that that change will evolve over time. But, um, you know, I think that it's it is going to have a profound impact on the European Union project, which I really believe in. It's the it's a peace project, first and foremost. Mm. That's where it originated. And it is disappointing and worrying to see that destabilised to a little bit. Yeah. And when I see Boris Johnson and... Donald Trump cozying up and the UK looking as though they're moving towards the US and you think about the geopolitical landscape and mm. you know the, the, there's a lot of upheaval uh, yeah. and I do worry you know uh, how that's going to work out. And do you think they thought it through like do you think like I, I saw a story today or this week in the Financial Times about uh, a meet, the meeting between Juncker and Boris Johnson where Juncker has supposedly told commissioners afterwards that it was the first time Boris Johnson f fully grasped what the single market meant. Yeah, I've heard those reports. I mean, we weren't in the room, so we mm. don't really know. And there's a lot of posturing going on yeah. on all sides, to be fair. And have, has, there has been for the last three years. Mm. Um, I, I don't believe Brexit was thought through. If you look at the papers the last week and the, the little snippets we've gotten from David Cameron's memoir mm. uh, for the record, you know, he's defending calling the referendum, which I, I actually think that was a bad idea. Mm. Um but he he believed he'd win it yeah. and he was genuinely committed to remain. And um, there really wasn't a plan B. There was no mm. plan to, to carry out Brexit. Nobody mm. really knew what Brexit was going to be, how it was going to look. And, um, you know, he openly says that uh, he says that Michael Gove and Boris Johnson got on the Brexit bus and left mm. the truth at home. Yeah. It doesn't really get more scathing than that. But he also said that um, Michael Gove was one of the people who said he shouldn't have the referendum. So, again, it shows the 
foolishness of calling it in the first place if the guy who's going to actually come out and, and be one of the lead uh, dissemblers <laughs> knows knows how toxic this is going to be. Completely. I think it took David Cameron by surprise. It appears they yeah. were very close friends. Mm. Um, both their families would have spent time together. And uh, I don't think he was expecting the betrayal as he would see yeah. it. Um, that that Michael Gove, I suppose, levelled on him, mm. and um, I think he was quite taken aback and almost he it's like it's almost like he froze when he saw what Boris Johnson and, and Michael Gove went about doing in terms of the campaign and didn't know how to tackle it, mm. and he said he was caught between being a prime minister and leading the Remain campaign, and he he wishes he did things differently, but mm. you know that's hindsight is a great thing, mm. and if we could go back and do things differently, maybe they would be different, but. You know, it, there definitely wasn't a plan for Brexit. And that's why it's been such a struggle for the last three years to try and, I suppose, get that policy delivered in the UK. When you say there's been posturing on both sides, like we've, we've seen what the UK have done, like it's, you know, it's, it's comical and it's, you know, it would be comical if it wasn't so dangerous. Mm -hmm. What posturing are you talking about on the EU side? Take, for example, that, 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 I suppose, now famous photograph when David Davis went over to negotiate with mm. the EU for the first time and he had no papers on the table. And mm. the EU team were there with piles of papers looking very prepared and ready mm. to go. You know, that was staged and it had a certain message to send out that mm. we're ready, but the UK are not. Um, could the know, UK not have just brought some papers? Did they they could have done, but I think they were just, they, they were caught off guard, right. you know, and it was so little things like that. There's been mm. little little plays um, the last three years. Take, for example, the, the press conference with, the, with Xavier Rattel, the Luxembourg PM mm. during the week. Um, it was handled badly. You know, Do you think he shouldn't have done that? Not exactly. I think Boris Johnson, you know, it was an unreasonable request at the last minute to just change the press conference mm. because the podiums were set up. And as you'll know here, setting up your tech and getting mm. your, your sound and equipment set up, you can't just pick up the podium and walk yeah. inside. It doesn't work like that. Mm. And also they would have had to have left 75% of the journalists outside because mm. there wouldn't have been space. So I think Boris Johnson's request was unreasonable. But equally, I don't think it helped that Xavier Patel took to the podium and left an empty podium beside him. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 I think that it, it just maybe added fuel to the fire. So there's been little things over the last three years on all sides. And um, is that include, do you include, is, like, is that the, the, the heart of, of the difference such as it is between Fianna Fáil's policy on Brexit and Fine Gael's? Because I saw Michal Martin the other night saying again that the megaphone diplomacy and the triumphalism uh, has which has given you know of of the Irish side after the original withdrawal agreement was mm. was made or was that deal was reached yeah. has led to the current difficulties. I think it played a I think it played a significant role. If we go back to when the backstop was born, this mm. now most hated mm. word. Um, you know when that initial agreement was reached and Protocol Forty Nine, which was the section in the 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 document mm. that became the backstop. Um, you know the Taoiseach went out and said that it was cast iron. Yeah. bulletproof and rock solid. It was mm. almost as though we've won this one. Yeah. And the negotiations hadn't even started, really. We were so far away. And that that got people's backs up on the other side, mm. rightly or wrongly. That was the yeah. the, the effect of it. Mm. So it's it's that kind of, um, you know, looking for the quick wins. It was it was premature. Who were they looking for the wins with? I think it was maybe a little bit of excitement that mm. we'd, we'd gotten something we wanted. Um, but you have to look at the bigger picture that this is going to this is always going to be a long road in terms mm. of negotiation. Um, but that turned the backstop into such a toxic issue and a toxic part of the of the of the agreement. Um, you know, now it's a, it's as though we can't even mention that word. It's it's so hated, mm. even though a lot of people, I believe, you know, particularly within the UK, maybe don't fully understand the, the, the intention behind it. Mm. You know, it was a good intention. It was there to protect peace and stability on this island. And the idea is that it would never be used. Yeah. It was there just in case. Um, but, you know, again, it, easy to look back. But again, I think there has been kind of posturing on all sides. And is that something like that? Is, is that retrievable now? Because, you know, like it has been a little bit noticeable in, in, re in the last week or so that the government have said this is, you know, they've been a bit quieter on things. Oh, uh, definitely. Um, I, I do think the government realised, you know, we need to take a, a calmer approach to this, mm -hmm. um, you know, less tweeting, less mm -hmm. photo calls, uh, less press conferences. You know, a lot of negotiations need to happen a bit more quietly yeah. um, and and take it, take it a bit more steady and not see little wins at the start as something that needs to be trumpeted. Um, look at the bigger picture. And is that important, apart from just on the Brexit uh, side of things, as regards to... 
like you talk about uh, Ireland going a different way than Britain mm-hmm. for the first time within within the EU and yeah. the EC. Like, is that tone important in that too, that we don't create a, a sense and a, an environment of friction and uh, that sort of, people have talked about Anglophobia. Like, would you say that's, a, that's something that has been sort of fueled by some of the comments? I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, we are, even though it might be hard to see it now, we are going to get to a point where Brexit stabilises, mm. you know, and we're going to get to a post-Brexit world where we just have to get on with things. Yeah. Um, but the UK and, and Great Britain will be our closest neighbour still, yeah. um, our nearest market. And I think probably most Irish people have family in the UK and vice mm. versa. We're so connected, you know, this cultural ties, this social ties. Um, so it's a really important relationship for both islands, mm. for both countries. And, you know, for the last 45 years, we've both been members of the European Union. So we've used, um, I suppose, the institutions of the EU to interact on a regular basis. So the prime minister in the UK and the Taoiseach of the day would meet regularly uh, at, yeah. at European Council meetings. Our ministers and their ministers would meet regularly at different committee meetings at, at an EU level. So that interaction was almost, it was done for us. You know, mm. th- those four were there for us. Um, that'll be gone so that we won't have those those spaces mm. to interact anymore. So we have a body of work to do when this does settle to mend the relationship because it's strained at the minute, mm. understandably, and to get back working together for both islands mm. um, and to put in place new mechanisms where we can continue to engage and have that dialogue and work together. Um, because I, I do genuinely believe that's in the best interests of citizens on both islands. And what about this, the, the people on, on this island then who identify as British? And like, where do you feel we are in regards? Like, I, I met someone last week who said, you know, the, there is a sense on both in, in all across across Ireland. And, and she works with people a lot in the unionist community, a lot in unions in business in the north. And it's like a united Ireland is coming now. That is the sort of growing sense that something has been uh, the genie is out of the bottle Um and, you know, like the best thing that was from the Northern Ireland Unionist point of view, the most the best way of keeping themselves in, in the UK now would be actually if they remained in the EU because there would be no change to the status. But that's that ship has sailed. Well, it, you know, I mean, I suppose the negotiations are still live to a certain extent. Mm. So maybe the ship hasn't fully sailed. I think, you know, there is a significant community in Northern Ireland, a unionist community mm. that are that are British yeah. uh, and they're perfectly entitled to take that view and I think we have to respect that mm. because we all share the island and live on the island together. Yeah. Um I want to see United Ireland, certainly mm. in my lifetime, and I hope that it's it's I hope that it's close. Um but if Brexit has taught us anything, it's that you do not have a referendum or a poll mm. on a major constitutional change without doing your work first. Yeah. We need to, we have a h- huge amount of work to do in terms of dialogue, public consultation um, and informing citizens that if you vote yes to this, here's exactly what it's going to look like. Mm. Here's what's going to happen. Um, you know, and, and things like the tricolour, our own Avene, yeah. they're all on the table. It's not a case of one section of the country, the island joining the other. Yeah, but that, is that important? That well, that doesn't that's happen. the conversation that has to happen. Yeah. And, you know, people need us need the space and an opportunity to have those conversations. So I think we're a long way off having that vote. I know there are calls um, in some quarters to have that vote now to fix yeah. Brexit. I think it's foolish and actually, I think it's a bit reckless to have those conversations in the middle of the Brexit crisis mm. because all you're doing is upsetting a significant community in the north. And we need to solve Brexit first and then we have a body of work to do before we have that, 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 that conversation. And is that something that, again, if there is a no deal, uh, is one of the many... Um, consequences of a no deal that people mm-hmm. really haven't thought through uh, it po- quite possibly um it could accelerate mm. that conversation yeah you know i mean if, if there's a no deal brexit there's predictions that the north could go into recession because they mm. don't have the same level of growth as the republic yeah um they wouldn't have the same reserves the same buffers that we would have so we're we're economically in a stronger position to withstand a no deal brexit mm. even though we're, we're looking at rural communities in the republic potentially going into decline before recovering again um, so if, if things go badly for Northern Ireland, um, you could very well see that conversation accelerated, which, you know, I mean, the DUP are very much of the view that, you know, backstop isn't allowed. We have to mm. be the exact same as Great Britain. We can't be treated differently. But by by possibly taking that position, they could very well accelerate the thing that they don't want. Yeah. Um, but, but is that also is that why we have to be 
a little bit skeptical of sort of the Sinn Féin position because they do want a united Ireland. They do seem to want it, mm-hmm. uh, uh, whatever the consequences to a degree. They're not looking for, they're looking for a border poll. They want these things to happen quickly. Yeah. Uh, so as, uh, as somebody's put it, like for Sinn Féin, a no deal is better than a good deal. Like, do they want, do you think they want a no deal even though they say they, they, they actually want to r- remain? I mean, I think their style of politics leaves a lot to be desired. Mm. Um, And, you know, I think I don't know is the answer. Is that the agenda behind what they're doing? I mean, I was taken aback that the Brexit vote happened, the referendum. And within no time, they were out calling for a border poll. Mm. You know, we were still reeling from that result, trying to deal with the aftermath of that. And straight away, they're pushing their political agenda. And, you know, th- and that got the backs of the unionist community up and then yeah. they became further entre- entrenched and became defensive, yeah. understandably. So it, it didn't help matters. Mm. And then the assembly has been collapsed for nearly two and a half years now. Yeah. No executive, no assembly. So Northern Ireland has been without political representation in its own devolved parliament for the entirety of the Brexit debate. It's mm. remarkable mm. and unforgivable and inexcusable. And I don't care what the reasons are. You know, this is such an existential crisis for Northern Ireland their politicians should be discussing it. Mm. Um, so I think Sinn Féin have a lot of questions to answer in that regard. And the DUP as well, you know, they are, they're supposed to be power sharing. Yeah. Um, so they are responsible also for the collapse of, of Stormont and the, and the Assembly. Um, and I, I just think ultimately the people losing out are people living in Northern Ireland. Mm. Uh, but has a penny dropped with, uh, like we saw Arlene Foster's comments when she was in Dublin and there seems to be some movement there. I thought that too. And I read the report in the Irish Times and I was reading it over... Uh, and then I went on to the DUP Twitter account and there's two or three tweets there that kind of put that to bed and, and clarify from their perspective. So, you know, this is how sensitive and yeah. every utterance, every word is just interpreted in, in several different ways mm. because people are, are people are so desperate to look for movement, yeah. to look for progress towards a deal that any a, any sentence can be can be taken out of context, maybe. And I mean, Arlene Foster is still saying OK, we accept we're on an island, but we will not accept checks in the Irish Sea. Mm. Um, if there is a no deal, how culpable would you say Leo Varadkar and Simon Coveney would be? Because you said in August, you said there's been a policy over the last three years of just let's wait and see and hope for the best. I think that policy still exists, to be honest. Um, you know, we were in the chamber yesterday having statements on Brexit. Um, and even last week I met with the Thonist and we still don't know where we were six weeks to go now mm. um, from from Brexit. Mm. And we have no idea what what plan B is. What, what is the border going to look like? Mm. What we know. I mean, the government have accepted now. Um, they were petrified to mention this six months ago, but they have accepted now that in order to protect the single market, checks will have to happen somewhere. Mm. So over a week ago, the Taoiseach made a speech to the British Irish Chamber dinner and he said uh, checks would happen some away from the border, Mm. some near the border, some at the ports. So this conversation's happening somewhere, but there's no, there appears to be no concrete plan B. Like, Mm. what are we going to do on November 1st Mm. if the worst happens? And, you know, Jean-Claude Juncker was saying yesterday, um, you know, when he he did a three hour kind of, I suppose, speech and Mm. contribution. (coughs) And he said um, that no deal is still very real and it's the most likely outcome because there has been no movement. Um, so I think our government have throughout the process almost been kind of crossing their fingers behind their backs and just hoping it doesn't happen. Mm. And I don't think we're we're ready if it does. But have they uh, fed into an environment where they've made it more likely to happen? I don't think they've made it more likely to happen. There's been so many cogs turning, uh, you know, mm. in this process. The, we can't control what happens in the UK. We can't control British politics. It's utterly broken. Um, and I think it's actually made our politics look really sensible and mm. kind of together. The one thing we can control, though, is our preparations. You know, yeah. how ready are we? And, you know, I was down at the ploughing yesterday and I heard Joe Healy on the radio saying, we've asked questions around the border. We still don't know what's happening. And um, businesses are saying the same. We can't tell people on November 1st how it's going to work. Mm. We have to give them some notice. And I understand the argument up until now, you know, we've had to keep the cards close to our chest. We don't want to undermine our negotiating position. We don't want to present what appears to be alternative arrangements. Um, the reality is that if there's a no-deal Brexit, what we have to do is really unpalatable and it's going to be really difficult. But somebody somewhere has to have an idea But is that, that is. It, is it still preferable to, have, like, people say that, the, that that's enough of an argument for budging on the backstop to move a little bit? But is moving on the backstop still uh, non-negotiable? Because even if the no-deal happens... 
there's, uh, as Leo Varad- Varadkar pointed out, there still has to be a deal at some point. Mm. Well, I suppose what he means by that is that if, if a no deal happens and a crash happens, mm. eventually the UK are going to have to come back to the table yeah. to try and negotiate a trading arrangement. And the EU have been really clear that, you know, if, if you crash out and you come back, you're still going to have to deal with citizens' rights, the withdrawal bill that you, mm. that you owe and the border issue in Ireland. Mm. Like those issues aren't going to just evaporate because you crash out. Yeah. So that's the same position. So that's why the moving on the backstop, you, you could create some long term problems. You see, I don't think there's an appetite for moving on it because mm. move to where or yeah. move to what? Um, one of the things that was thrown around is, you know, should we time limit the backstop? Mm. But that just means the problem that you have today just comes back to you in five, five years time mm. or three years time or whatever. So you don't solve that problem. You just kick the can down the road. And I think that the, the worry is that, you know, we've got the support now of all of the other member states. Um, the EU negotiating team are fully with Ireland on this, that if we allow that issue to slip mm. and we get into t- discussing future trade, there's a concern that we might never come back to having that same focus on getting the border issue solved. Mm. Um, we'll move away from it. Uh, why did you join Fianna Fáil? Um, I joined God, over 10 years ago now. Yeah. Um, I was in the Army Reserve at the time. Yeah. Um, so a good friend of mine was involved with Fianna Fáil locally and he was chair of the local common. And he asked me to long to a meeting and kind of went from there. So I went, went along for a look and just... Um, you liked what, like, it's, was, it, was it a strange yeah. thing for... Because I saw you, was it, you were on uh, front line with some friends. With Pat Kenny, yeah. yeah. Pat Kenny showed the front line. I was in my master's course in UCD at hmm. the time and actually... Separately to that, one of the girls I was really, really good friends with um, was involved in the Kev- Kevin Barry Common in UCD. So okay. she was a member of Ogre Fianna Fáil. Um, so we ended up on Pat Kenny's show just in the audience. We got tickets and yeah. went around for the crack. Right. And, you know, as was normal for me, my hand went up and I had something to say because I can't stay quiet. And Connor, my friend at home, seen was watching the show. Yeah. And that's what prompted him to ask me to come to a meeting. And what were you on talking about and what was the show about? I remember the topic was the sexualization of young children in the media. Right, okay. Don't know if we just turned up and whatever yeah. topic was on was right. on, yeah. Okay. But I, I remember the topic because I spoke on it. And okay. Yeah, yeah. And did you think, like, because, you know, to lots of people, the idea of, you know, when you're 22 or whatever it was, joining Fianna Fáil would seem like, you know, the most alien concept possible. Yeah, I get asked that a lot. I suppose at the time, you know, I was invited to a local meeting. I wasn't making, you know, a really big decision to yeah. join. It wasn't like, I wasn't signing up on the night. I was just going to see what it was like. Yeah. And it just, it was really organic. It kind of just was gradual. Mm. Um, you know, I went to a few events and I was just going to the odd meeting. And it just, over time, mm. you know, I didn't feel, it, at the time, I didn't realise, I didn't didn't feel like I was making a big decision. Right. You know. Um, and was that pro, pre the, the crash or was it? Was well, you're right in the middle of it. Right in the middle yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, right in the middle of it. Um, so, yeah, it seems unusual. I think it was the, it was the, the local organisation was very much focused on local issues. Okay. So when we met locally, you had your local TD and councillors and it was, you know, it was local services and local issues. Mm. And that was kind of the focus of it. Yeah. So that's it just kind of grew from there then. But then but as it grew, did you then encounter kind of anger about what Fianna Fáil had done to the country at that stage? To a certain extent. But I suppose, I mean, I was in my early 20s, mm. you know, I wasn't involved in the the government at the time. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I suppose, part of a new generation starting out. Mm. Um, and, you know, I've been in the party for, I suppose, coming up in a couple of years and I became chairperson of the local mm. common, um, so I took over Connor's job, right. um, and um, things just things just kind of happened as they often do in politics. Sometimes just events take over, and you're in the right place at the right yeah. time. And the 2011 general election came along, and local TD Beverly Flynn decided she wasn't going to run again. Mm. Now I had never ever thought about running for elected politics. Um, I had left my master's course. I was gone on to the King's Inns to do my barrister mm. training. And I had set plans. I was going to go to Australia after that. My friends were already out there. So, yeah. you know, I had my few years mapped out as right. to where I was going. So I was living in Dublin at the time and um, the campaign was getting underway and Beverly had stepped down. And then I got a call from Connor. Right. So I'm going to blame Connor for all of this. And uh, he said, we're, we've, I've been asked to ask you if you'd go on the ticket with yeah. Dara Cleary for the election. And like I've known Connor for years, he was a sergeant in the FCA unit, mm. total joker. I thought he was messing, you know, because right, yeah. uh, it was the first I'd ever heard of or ever even thought about it. And he said, no, I'm, I'm serious. And I was like, right, uh, well, when do I need to decide by? He said, tomorrow. 
Right. So I had 24 hours basically to make the call. To, t- to turn your life around, like to change your to life. Change, like to I was in the middle of the King's Inns and I wasn't that far off my final exams. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I don't know what it was. I kind of felt probably won't get th- an opportunity like this again. I do enjoy it. Um, and I kind of, I, I just went with it. Like I spoke to my, my, my boyfriend and my friends mm. and my parents and kind of got their views on it. My mum was really worried. Um, yeah. Your parents I, weren't political? Not a bit. No, there's no politics in our house at all. And it wasn't until after I joined Fianna Fáil that I realised mum's family were Fine Gael and my dad's family were Fianna Fáil. Okay. On my, my grandparents. Right. Thing. But mum and dad were never But it wasn't there. handed down to you because, like, I remember my family, like, my mother's side of the family were all Fianna Fáil and my grandmother would ring before, the night before an election, that mm. she would ring my mother and say, don't forget your, your daddy yeah. now tonight, tomorrow. Yeah. And that would be the, sign, the code for voting Fianna Fáil. But you weren't, wasn't no, handed down. Do you know, I think probably because both my, grandpa, my, both my grandfathers died quite young, so I never met okay. my grandfathers. Yeah. Um, I suppose, and of that generation, the men of the house tended to be the more political. Yeah. And I later learned then that my grandfather, my mum's dad, um, was a huge Fine Gael supporter. He would have right. had one of the first cars in the village and driven people to the polling station. Okay. And then my grandfather, on, like my dad's dad, yeah. was staunch Fianna Fáil right. and, you know, would have been involved in the common in in. In, in in his area, okay. so, but I learned this afterwards. Right. Um. So. So yeah. it was then in the family. Was it, you know it skipped both a generation. Both sides of the family. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. mum and dad just you know they both voted. We always voted. Yeah. Um. But mum would always say you know read the leaflets and make up your own mind. Right. So that was it. But like so you you've got this path. You're going to Australia. Your friends are all going there. Ireland is in a in a slump. Like getting yeah. out is what people are doing. Yeah. At that stage, um. Like, it, did your friends say, look at you and go, what, what are you, what are you doing? And also at that stage, by the time the 2011 election came around, there was so much anger towards oh. Fianna Fáil everywhere. Yeah, well, I think my friends, I suppose they know me well and they probably knew when I was talking to them that it nearly had off my mind anyways. Right, okay. And I was always, you know, I, I kind of was always one for giving things go mm. and I found the prospect kind of exciting and, you know, it what was, was a challenge. What, in what, what was the challenge for you? Because like... What did you think you were going to, what, what was the excitement? What did it center on? Because, you know, you will hear that the, the cynical, cliched view of politicians is, you know, they're just in it for them, themselves or whatever. Yeah. Like when you tell that story, it's hard to see that that's what's what you're thinking. But tell me what you were thinking. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I thought this was an opportunity. I said, you know, it was always very difficult to get onto a party ticket to run for election. Mm. There's a huge Diff, you know, huge challenge to get onto a ticket. That's the first battle people yeah. don't often see is the internal conventions and getting right. onto a ticket. And here, here I was getting asked, you know, d- did I want a place on the Fianna Fáil ticket yeah. for an election? And I thought, OK, I'm probably not going to get this opportunity again. And then I felt, you know, this is in my head, I felt, you know, the ball only ever hops once. Mm. You, you have to grab it. And although I knew my chances of being elected were pretty much slim to none. Right. I kind of thought, you know, this could be an opportunity to maybe start in politics. Yeah. Because um, lots of politicians have run for election and lost their first election or two or even yeah. three yeah. before they actually get there. And I, I, at that point, I really loved politics and I was interested. Okay. And so it was a gamble and it was a risk. And there was a lot of concern that, oh, it's a really difficult election. I'm not sure mm. you should be putting yourself out there. And um, But I said, look, I'm going to go for it. Mm. We'll see how it works out. Um, it's not going to be the end of the world if it doesn't work out. Mm. You know, I'm just about to qualify as a barrister. I'm going to go traveling. I had stuff going okay. on. So I, I guess I'm kind of I'm kind of a positive enough person anyways. <laughs> right. You need to be, I suppose, to, <laughs> to head into that. Um, and it was like two days later, I was down launching my campaign in Mayo, making my first ever, I suppose, maiden political speech. Yeah. Um, nervous as hell. Yeah. Um, I'll never you, forget you the feeling. say you're a shy person. I'm shy more so. Like, I don't. I'm. I'm actually fine now with public speaking, right. and that doesn't bother me so much. It's the social situation that's right. heading into, say, the dinner dances or the okay. big events. I find that bit more difficult. Um, but definitely that first speech, because it was my first ever mm. political speech, that was nerve wracking. Um, so I how did you find that. that aspect of Irish politics? Because that's the thing that uh, seems to have sort of plagued Irish politics as much as anything. The idea that you have to not just the so you know the dinner dance, but you have to be at every event. You can't miss a thing in your constituency. You have to s- yeah. serve your constituents uh, above all else. Yeah. And, you know, everything is like politics is local to the degree that it doesn't really matter and nothing else really matters. And like, to, do you think that's like, how did you like adapt to that? And also, do you think it's something that goes against is to the detriment of actually achieving you know, what you might want for, for the country as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I still struggle with that stuff, mm. if I'm being honest. I mean, I'm what, 
eight, nine years now in politics since I ran my mm. first campaign. Um, and it's been a work in progress for me, yeah. definitely. You know, I I would have to be nearly coaxed to go into a room and right. told to get in there now. And okay. and I just would just have to, I just would take a breath and go, yeah. OK, just go, just get in. Yeah. You know, so I, f- I still find that I'm a little bit better at that now. You know, if I'm going into a public meeting, for example, and there's like a table where all the representatives sit and you go up and you, you say your bit and you answer questions and take and debate. No problem. Mm. I, I really love that stuff. It's the it's the, I suppose, the more kind of relaxed, nearly mm. things that aren't set and you don't really know what the, the evening's going to be like. Right. I find that a bit more difficult, but that's just my personality. OK. Um, and I, don't, <coughs> I think you kind of have to try and be yourself as well. I'm not I'm not the person that busts into the room and starts shaking hands at everyone and walking. Or I just I'm not that person. OK. And I never will be. And I think if you try and be something you're not, you'll just come across as fake. Um, so you but need does that count against you in a constituency sense? Um, it can do. I mean, I would often have gotten back at the start. Oh, you know, she's very standoffish, like and she's yeah. a bit cold and you know, she doesn't really say hello. And I'm just nervous and shy mm. and I found found that stuff difficult. Mm. So I do make an effort. I try my best and that's all you can do. And, you know, I've gotten more confident at doing that stuff. Mm. But then you ask me to get up at a podium and deliver a speech on something that I know and I've done my work on. Mm. No problem. Like, I, I love that stuff. Yeah. So I thought the difficulty with Irish politics is you're kind of expected to be brilliant at everything. Right. You know, you're expected to be well prepared, intelligent, a good debater, mm. a great people person, um, you know, ready for anything, flexible. And, you know, it's it's well, you can't be good at everything. Do you think it works? Irish politics, if that's what you're, exp- if that's what the expectations are of politicians. Um, I think it's difficult, but it, I mean, it is working um, yeah. and you've got lots of different personalities in it all. I mean, you only have to look at, you know, look at a rock TV and you'll see the different styles of politics. <laughs> you, you, you were going to say someone there and then you just. <laughs> well, you know, there's different styles of politician um, and, you know, and I think, const- you know, there's different maybe differences across constituencies as well and urban versus mm. rural and. You know, I think I think it's changing to a certain extent. Um, but does it? But again, is it serve like when you say it's working and there's different po- politics styles? Like you talk about your family background, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, and lots of people now would wonder, like, what's the point in two parties, especially as one is supporting the other in government now? And then you look at say the narcissism of minor differences, the stories you hear about, you know, the, the rivalries on tickets in constituencies, like. Mm-hmm. These seem to be the things because of the system, the way it's set up, yeah. that kind of drive and motivate a number, a lot of politicians rather than saying, this is what I believe in. I don't need to canvas for every vote. Yeah, you know, I can actually follow through on what I believe in. Well, that's that should be the basis of every politician's motivation, mm. I think. Um, and there's been a couple of issues in the last years in, partic- in the last few years in particular that have really tested that, mm. you know, are you going to actually go out and campaign and have an opinion and do what you, what you think is right? Or are you going to say, well, what's going to work better in the constituency? Yeah. And I think, you know, I think people got scared with certain issues mm. in the last you couple of years. Repeal. And um, that's one of them. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, that tested people. Mm. That was that was a scary time to be in politics. Um, Why? Just the lobby was so intense, mm. you know, I mean, between constant emails and really nasty emails right. um you know really abusive emails threatening emails yeah. um phone in the office hopping twitter facebook instagram you're so contactable it's yeah. just it's kind of coming at you from all sides mm. um and like it is it does put you under pressure and did you make you question what you were <coughs> saying i could never have gone a different way on that issue mm. it just i couldn't have looked myself in the mirror Mm. You know, I just felt so strongly about it. Mm. Um, and I tried and, and and I took the same view. I thought, you know, there are people on the other side of that argument that equally feel strong about no. Mm. And I, you have to try and respect that. Mm. And I suppose because I was on the the um, Eighth Amendment Committee, mm. the the Oireachtas Committee that, that dealt with this first, yeah. really, before everybody else in the doll had to deal with it, there was a small committee of us that had to go first. Mm. And um, so we were probably we were more exposed first. Yeah. And, you know, the public got to see what our views were before anybody else had to really make a call. And I remember pressing the button in the committee to, to vote. And you did feel like, oh, here we go. You know, here it's, it's the mm. avalanche is going to come down now. Yeah. Um, and I know people were under pressure. Like I, I just come into that committee and people went out to take a break and you could just see that you could see the stress and the pressure mm. people were under. And, and then that that obviously spilled over into the, the doll chamber when the debates kicked off and mm. the referendum kicked off. So there are issues that come along that test politicians mm. and test their mettle and you know take for example the 21 MPs in the UK that that lost the party whip in the Tory yeah. party because 
they did what they felt was right to protect mm. their country. Um, they're not on party tickets now. They've lost yeah. their jobs effectively. Mm. And, it, it, par- and I, felt, I felt really sorry for them. But I actually thought, you know, it's, you've actually restored people's faith in politics to a certain extent mm. that there are people there willing to just mm. to put their job on the line and do the right thing. But no, it doesn't seem to, like, nothing seems to work like that anymore though, because only people uh, who feel one thing, no, it doesn't restore the faith of the other side to anything. Like everything seems to be so polarised that like, you know, people want their politicians, the politicians do what, what they agree with, mm-hmm. their heroes, if they do what they disagree with. Yeah. They're, they're everything that everyone says about politicians. And I'm wondering, like, when you talk about the, uh, the you know, how contactable you are and, and during, like, repeal and all that kind of stuff, like, how mm. wearing is that on a day-to-day basis that, you know, you can be, like, and I imagine, like, the, the stuff, you know, I got, you know, t- tiny fraction of that occasion, yeah. like, during that, but, like, just to be turning on, looking at your phone on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, getting that abuse. Yeah. Like, do you look at it and think, I'd be better off going to Australia? <laughs> um, like, you have your bad days, yeah. you know. And um, there are times when I'd, I can't actually look at social media today. I'd have to, I have to take a break. Yeah. Or, like, I'll get, um, you know, I'll get one of the girls in the office to just say, can you just keep an eye on that because I'm, I'm not doing that today. Mm. So, yeah, you have to mind your mental health. So definitely. Um, yeah. There's no doubt about that. You do need a thick skin. You have to remind yourself that for the most part, it's not personal because they don't actually know you um, and they're angry about the issue and that's fine. And then you have to also remind yourself that you'll never please everyone. Mm. You cannot please all of the people all of the time. And you're torn between, you know, you're elected as a representative for your constituency. So it is representative democracy. Mm. So you are supposed to take on board the views of those that have elected you because they've they've elected you to represent them. Mm. Um, But at the same time, you are supposed to form your own opinions. Yeah. And on any given issue, you know, whether it's even as localised as hedge cutting is mm. really contentious. Mm. You know, people want the hedges cut to keep the roads clear and others want to let them grow to let the birds and the bees. Yeah. You know, so there's even every little issue, people have a different view. But does it does it become more, is it more hostile? Like, OK, you you haven't, you weren't in politics before social media, but like, yeah. do you think it's more hostile now? So like, you know, 20 years ago, a view on, on, on hedges mm. might, might have been polarised, but you wouldn't get you wouldn't get the reaction and the feedback and the instant feedback that you might get today. Well, it is instant, that's for sure. Yeah, um, yeah I th- things can blow up really quickly, mm. you know. And um, if, this, if, if a topic is particularly sensitive, mm. um, you know, they can just hone in on you and either side of the debate. And, you know, you, if you're pleasing one side, you're probably upsetting the other side. Yeah. Uh, and that's just... That's just part of the job of being a politician, you know. What does, like, getting a thick skin and, uh, you know, looking after your mental health actually mean in this context? Because, again, I know, you know, when, from times when things, you know, would flare up on Twitter or something, you can say all that stuff. Yeah. But it doesn't really, you know, the one piercing comment or the one mm. brutal thing just lodges with yeah. you. So, like, I don't know how, like, do you have to take action rather than just say like this isn't personal this isn't because like that's very that's all well and good but it's it's that's exhausting in itself too it is i kind of like you take little steps like you know when i first started doing um say for example the vincent brown show yeah and then i would look at twitter after the show Mm -hmm. and then i wouldn't be able to sleep because some of the stuff was just awful you get some nice comments but then you thought okay i'm not gonna look at twitter tonight because i actually do want to go home and get some sleep so it's just um you know just trying to limit it to a certain... You see, you can't not use those tools. Yeah. You're expected. And in, and in this job, if I'm not putting a tweet out on something Brexit-related, that's, it means yeah. I have an opinion. I haven't commented. Um, so we're expected to use the tools. Mm. And if we're not, we're not doing our jobs properly. Yeah. But at the same time, if you don't limit your interaction on mm. those spaces... Um, you know, I mean, I think... I, I do think the days of doing 30 or 40 years in politics... I couldn't imagine spending that long in this job. I don't think you'd survive it. Really? Yeah, I just think it's, you know, I think it's too... I think you'd be a broken person at the end of it. Really? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think it's too pressurised and too... You know, it's so intrusive. Yeah. It's so intrusive. And is that even truer for, for women in politics today? Like, we're meant to be... Um, it's meant to be changing. But when I talk about my experience on social media, you know, it's nothing compared to 
what women experience in social media and that that hostility and misogyny that that women get you get you get a bit of that you know i see comments like oh she's only a dumb blonde and she's yeah. you know like not that my why would my hair color matter i don't know and i mean i i'm 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 not stupid you know yeah, i'm, I'm yeah. bright enough yeah. i think and um, so you do get some of that commentary you're like or you know your your makeup isn't good enough mm. for your clothes or so we probably get more commentary on appearance Mm. than maybe the guys will get. But, mm. you know, the, the guy, the men in politics get a lot of abuse as well. Like, it's, okay. it does happen um, for both, you yeah. know. Um, so I don't know what you can do about that. I think we could all try and be a bit kinder to one another. Um, you know, comments, it's very easy to bang off a comment off your phone, your laptops, mm. you know, sitting on your couch at home. You know, you're useless, you're stupid, you're X, mm. Y, and Z. You know, it, at the end of the day, we are people. Yeah. Um, we do have feelings, you know, yeah. we're not stones. <laughs> so and sometimes I think people think, oh, that's a politician. We can say whatever we want. They d- that doesn't impact them. But then but do you not feel if you say you've got a th- you have to have a thick skin, people just think, oh, then we can say what we like. Maybe oh, it's fine to I, say. I've no doubt the commentary be like, well, then don't be doing the job if you can't handle yeah. it. So you can't win. Because like. I've noticed why we had a politician. Uh, I won't I don't know. What, when Lynn Boylan was here. I don't know why I wasn't going to say her name. I asked her, the first question I asked her was about losing her seat and how that felt. Yeah. And I thought, and we talked about it afterwards, like she was slightly startled at being asked about how, her, she, felt. how she felt. I know. <laughs> because it's assumed that you just come in yeah. and you do an interview and it's like, you know, throw a few like, you know, barbs and like, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But actually to say, how do you feel? is kind of not what's meant to be asked of a politician. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it, it'll, it happens to most politicians eventually that you lose your seat. Very, mm. you know, very few politicians know when the right time is to exit mm. and when to step aside and let somebody else through. And, um, you know, I haven't experienced that yet and yeah. maybe I will, who knows. But um, I'm, I can only imagine it's pretty devastating. Like you've lost your job, yeah. you know, and you've lost the team that you work with and, you know, the way you've been, your life has, has changed. Mm. And, um, and, and, and rejection she said that was the thing she felt yeah, she like felt she actually felt rejected be very public humiliation yeah, as well yeah. um and then everyone's looking to see well what did you do wrong yeah, to cause it yeah. so there's very little sympathy i think um mm. and and that's politics it's representative democracy and there's always changeover but of course you're going to be upset yeah. about losing your seat but it is interesting that you say that because like what do you see as a future then for politics if you're going to come in and what do uh, five ten years and just be b- actually burned out by the process of it um like five or ten years is actually a really short time in politics mm. like i'm three and a half years now in the doll and you know it's 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 slow to get stuff done and there is there's definitely a benefit of having a bit of experience mm. you know as every year goes on you know i feel like i understand the system better i'm you know i know what i'm doing a bit better mm. you, you learn every year you're learning as well mm. so it's good to have people with experience yeah. um everybody can't be in their first term or else mm. nobody know what they're at, mm. you know, and you need, it's good to have a little bit of changeover. It's good to bring in fresh people, you know, into the, the doll and the Shannon and into every political party. So you need that constant changeover, but you can't have everyone changing at the same time. Mm. Um, in the last doll in, in 2016, the last election, it was like the biggest changeover. I think, I think we'd like in the region of say 50 new people mm. coming in. You wouldn't usually have that much changeover in one election, electoral cycle. Mm. Um, so I think, um, you know, I just think maybe 40 years, like, I mean, Linda Kenny was over 40 years in politics. Yeah. I just can't even imagine spending that long, right. you know, and that's from a different time. Yeah. And um, so maybe that length of service. OK, so, is, you're, is, so you're just going to do 25 years. It's 25 seems like a long time. I'm only three. <laughs> three I'm only three <laughs> in. <laughs> so I don't know. Who knows? You yeah, know? but it is an interesting because Nicola Mallon was on last week and we, we she talked about this as well and the where and tear and I think maybe there's uh, it's not unique to Northern Irish politics but there's again the polarisation yeah I can imagine the diff yeah it's a different space really isn't it and she has to like try and sit in rooms with people who are yeah uh, you know who are just shouting yeah and like you talk about Irish politics and how well it's doing at the moment do you think we've we've avoided that stuff for the for the most part like for repeal them. maybe have been one of the instances where we didn't avoid it. Where it was quite heated. Yeah. That was quite heated, yeah. But um, you know, at the end of the day, w- when we got past the campaign, we all still talked to each mm. other. It's not, you know, we, we it was for the most part, it was respectful. There yeah. was the odd slip, I think, from some people, but it was for the most part quite respectful within the doll anyways and the, and the committee. Um, so I, I think, you know, I think we, see, we do seem to have escaped that to a certain extent. Mm. Um, hopefully it stays that way. Uh, it doesn't seem to be as polarised here. Yeah. You know, and I think if you look, say, at, um, you know, Boris Johnson calling Jeremy Corbyn a 
giant chlorinated chicken and mm. a big curl supplies. I just can't imagine that happening here. And yeah. I actually don't think Irish people would really like that. Yeah. You know? No, it doesn't really seem to have played with, with Irish, with that kind no. of that stuff. Well, like, the media is slightly different too. They never it is. come yeah. in for that. Yeah. Um, you talked about not having, you know, you can't have people all in their first term. Do you think your youth has ever been held against you when you're, you know, with something like Brexit especially? Like, is it, is it, uh, like, do you ever get a sense that people are kind of thinking, you know, you, you have a lot to learn? Um, maybe they do. They've never said it to me. Yeah. You know, I'm sure if they're, they're, they're probably expecting somebody maybe a little bit older and um, maybe they do wonder, you know, yeah. about experience. But I suppose I'm, you know, I have I have my own life experiences to bring to yeah. the table. So I don't know. I mean, th- there's been times, you know, I've, at the beginning, um, say, interacting maybe with different politicians from other countries where they're going on so who do you work for they're right. assuming that i'm there as a member okay. of staff and okay. I'm, like, oh, no, I'm actually the td <laughs> nice to meet you <laughs> so there's been a couple of instances yeah. of that um but for the most part i mean you know i feel like i've been treated as an equal yeah. genuinely you yeah. know i've had no difficulties and i've always been able to get my speak in and do, do my work talk to me finally about the defense forces and you know that was a, that was your passion was it was yeah. that yeah, I actually met up with the guys from my officers course the weekend. We meet up every year. We right. go and do some sort of a, a kind of an activity for the day and then head out. So um, it was a, it was a huge part of my life. Like I joined when I was late teens. Yeah. I was still in secondary school in the barracks in Castlebar. Mm. And um, I remember it was my neighbour, Anne-Marie, actually, who was a couple of years older. She was sending me in to join up. And she said, you know, whatever you do, don't go in the first door. Make sure you go up the stairs and go in the second door. I didn't really know what the difference yeah. was. I later learned that the first door was the battalion and the second door was the cavalry. So I joined the cavalry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tamri. <laughs> right. um, so, um, yeah, I joined. About 20 of us joined together that night. And a few years later, it was just me left out of that intake. Right. And I just took to it. Just loved it. Um, Why? You know, it was just so different. You know, we'd be heading off on, you know, week, a week or two training every year. We'd be doing ca- weekends away, training nights. Um, I was doing weapons training. Mm. I was teaching people. I think because I was given s- responsibility within the unit. You know, mm. I was I became an instructor at a very early age. Um, I climbed the ranks. I had done my NCOs course and went on to do both officer courses mm. and just met so many good friends through through the organization. And, you know, I've been in every barracks in the country nearly. And, um, you know, what else? What other hobby can you get where you get to, you know, do cross country driving and right. fire, you know, fire on a, ri- a yeah. rifle range and do orienteering and night navigations mm. and I just loved it because it was different um, and I loved the fitness aspect of it. Yeah. It kept me really fit um, and I liked the the career progression within the organisation as well mm. and um, yeah, it was just just it, it, there's no doubt in my mind that joining what was the FCA then and then mm. became the Reserve Defence Forces shaped the person that I am. Really? No, oh, absolutely. You know, mm. it really did. Um, it was definitely a defining f- moment for me when I walked in the doors of the cavalry, <laughs> cavalry unit in Castlebar. Right. I didn't know it at the time, um, but yeah, it had a huge impact on and me. And you think it was it led you? Do you think you'd have been less likely to become a politician? Probably, actually. You know, it it, it taught me from a quite a young age, like leadership skills mm. and confidence and public speaking. Mm. You know, like I was early twenties and I was up. I I'd be giving lectures on like the GPMG which is the, the machine gun we used to use and I'd be, yeah. I'd be training others yeah. so I had my own class and I was responsible for getting them trained and passed and I did my driving course through the, the cavalry so I never set a civilian test I did an army test okay. and did a full driving course okay. so it was it was cool like I so loved you can drive it. a tank uh, never gone to a tank. Yeah. I got a minibus. Right, okay. Not quite as exciting. <laughs> that was the next Everyone level probably up. asks about a tank. Do <laughs> they, they do, yeah. No, no, no. Um, no, we started at four by four and a, and a okay. trailer on the back and then progressed to the minibus. But um, it was just, every, th- there was nothing negative about it. It was all positive. Um, and I'm still like, I mean, and every year we'd march in the St. Patrick's Day parade. And one mm. of the years I got to lead the parade with the tricolour um, okay. in my army, in my officer uniform. Um, so just so many amazing experiences throughout the years that. I can't really thank the organisation enough, really, yeah. you know, for, for the impact it had. Um, do you think it's been a mistake not to, like, to allow Brexit to stop you calling an election? Um, I, I think Brexit is a mistake, yeah. <laughs> to yeah, be yeah. honest. Um, but if you, when you say it's going to go on for decades, like, is there ever going to be, when you look back now, you think, well, actually, there's a year there where maybe there was an opportunity to call an election. The Fianna Fáil is so opposed to the, like things this government is doing on housing. And we had Micheál Martin on this show last year talk passionately about 
the class-based policies of Fine Gael on yeah. housing. And it's the issue that you know among your generation. It's huge. It's like huge. It's, yeah. I mean, you know, we couldn't really have known how the year was going was going mm. to develop. And we've been kind of on this cliff edge. Even so we were kind of working up to March. Like, like yeah. March was the last deadline for the mm. cliff edge. And we didn't go over the cliff, thankfully. Mm. And then it moved on to October. And we we just haven't really known what was going to happen. So when I say Brexit will be with us for the next couple of decades, you know, I mean, the impact of, yeah, of them yeah, leaving yeah. and the future yeah. trading negotiations. But the immediate threat of a potential no deal mm. We're six weeks away from that. Mm. Um, and the difficulty is that I, I think the, the the era of majority governments is, is probably gone in this mm. country. Um, so we know from the last occasion in 2016, it took us nearly three months to negotiate a confidence and supply arrangement yeah. and to get a minority government in place. Um, and it'll probably take something around that again. I mean, definitely it'll take a number of weeks. Mm. And we felt that given where the country is at and how precarious a position we're in and how vulnerable jobs in so many sectors are, we couldn't plunge the country into an election mm. and spend weeks in a back room trying to negotiate a deal with whoever we can, you know, try and put a government together with and leave the country without a government. Um, mm. It just right now, I just think it would be not the right thing for the country. And when you go back, when you when it does happen, do you expect like when you go back, look back on that election in 2011 and what you encountered on the doorsteps, do you think the mood has has changed towards Fianna Fáil? Oh, completely. I mean, so I, I mean, I ran in 2011 in the general election. I went on then in 2014 to run in the local elections mm. and I got elected as a councillor. Mm. So even in that three year period, like I was working as a local area rep mm. in the area. So I was out canvassing all the time and I could see a mood change, you know, just that I think people were willing to give me a chance because I was new as well. Mm. Um, and they were getting an opportunity to get to know me as, as a candidate. And then the 2016 election and even more recently then we've had another round of local elections mm. and European elections, which obviously I, I was heavily involved in. I was director of elections for the European elections nationally. Mm. So there's definitely been a change. And, you know, the message we get back is that they want a change of government. Um, so and do, you, do you encounter that feeling from people your own age? Because, like, you know, you, you know people uh, under 35, a lot of them seem to think Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil, they have the view that they're interchangeable. Uh, and that we, we let you know one goes out and the other goes in, but nothing actually. Once those two are the parties of power, nothing really changes. I don't actually get that, and that's a very simplistic view. But I think people under the age of thirty-five are as informed as. No, I'm not age, saying, but they, know, they, I don't mean that they're not informed. I mean that they're the ones who've experienced the uh, the worst, the of worst it. of it. Yeah, I mean that's that's on my 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 generation. Mm. But do um, they forgive? Do they forgive Fianna Fáil for what they their part in it? I think you know like. Th they're looking to where they're at now mm. and they're looking at a housing crisis and a rental crisis and, you know, home ownership. We're now down at, I think, about 65 percent home ownership, mm. which is really low for the country. Um, and I think people in their in their 30s and 40s in particular that are struggling to pay rent, that are in a position where their rent can be increased year on year by, you know, 4 percent in rent pressure zones. It's still a, a good increase mm. um, and just can't get on the property ladder. They're absolutely they're just fed up. They want to change. They want to see a government that's actually going to genuinely tackle the housing problem. Mm. Um, and they don't see Fine Gael as being that government that's going to do it because they've had a decade almost in government mm. now. And the housing crisis is getting worse every month. There are more and more people coming into homelessness. Rents are continuing to spiral and home ownership percentages are dropping. So the evidence is there for itself. People can see that the government currently are not getting to grips with housing mm -hmm. and, and they do want to change. And I hope they'll vote for that change and I hope that we get an opportunity to make those changes. But it will ultimately come down to the electorate and the decision that the people make. Where do you see Brexit ending up in the short term? Not the decades, but in the short term. In the short term. Um, looking at it, you know, I think Boris Johnson is, is in a corner. The only way that he can leave on October 31st now is with a deal because no mm. deal has become illegal in the UK. Mm. Um, so can he get a deal over the line? I don't know. There's two schools of thought on that. There are people that are more positive than others, saying that something's, in, something's happening in the background, there's some movement. Um, but the DUP don't appear to have moved mm. at all. So then is he looking to Labour to try and get a bit of support, to try mm. and get an amended deal through, uh, maybe a Northern Ireland-specific backstop? That is the obvious solution. You cannot have the North diverge in any way in terms of mm. customs and regulation and have no border. It just You can't square that circle. Mm. So a Northern Ireland specific backstop is the solution. And it would, be fan it, it would be a fantastic outcome for Northern Ireland because they would get the best of both markets. They would still be part of the UK, mm. access to the, the UK market and the same with the European Union market. So mm. 
they would become a really, I think, attractive place for foreign direct investment. So it could be the one little silver lining mm. out of it all. Um, if only there could be movement in that direction. I think if that doesn't happen, um, we're looking at a, a general election in the UK. Mm. Um, and I would be really worried, actually, that if if the deal isn't done and there is a general election in the UK, it's looking as though the Conservative Party are going to win that election mm. currently. And they may deliver an even harder Brexit mm. than what's currently been proposed. Um, so I actually think it's in our interest to see that deal done before October 31st. Lisa, thanks very much for coming Thank you today. very much. Well, who knows where we're going to be with Brexit uh, next, but that was a fascinating conversation with Lisa Chambers. Before we go, don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels. And if you like the show, please leave a review.